Just how big were prehistoric humans really? It is a question that invites all our myth-making instincts, the seven-foot-tall giants of folklore, the titans of marble and stone, but the truth is more interesting than myth. Bone by bone and print by print, the Pleistocene answers in the language of weight-bearing surfaces and stress lines, in the thickening of cortices and the geometry of joints, in the quiet arithmetic of bone length and density. If we listen closely to what skeletons and footprints are saying, a portrait emerges that is far richer than a number on a chart. It is a story about environment and competition, about tool loads and prey size about the plain physics of moving a body through difficult terrain. It is a story in which a tibia from an English gravel pit, a jaw from a German sandworks, a skull from a Zambian quarry, a femur from a Namibian cave, and a set of newly discovered ghostly footprints pressed into a lakeshore in central Germany all become the narrators of human scale. The Boxgrove tibia is the kind of bone that makes even seasoned archaeologists and anatomists instinctively take notice. Excavated on the Sussex coast from deposits laid down almost half a million years ago, it does not whisper delicacy or spare forms. It is thick-walled, broad-shafted, and engineered like a column, the cross-section a blueprint for resisting the cyclical loads of a body that moved constantly over uneven ground with weight in its hands. This tibia, attributed to Homo heidelbergensis, hints at a person whose body mass did not live in the margins, Reconstructions that translate circumference into pounds consistently land in ranges that, in our modern world, we associate with rugby forwards and football linebackers. 250 pounds of lean muscle is not an outlandish estimate, and the associated stature estimates hover in the realm of taller-than-average modern men. The tibia's story is not that of a giant, but of a robust, powerful human adapted to a cool climate and to a life of frequent exertion hauling butchered meat, moving raw stone, running down prey across marshy flats. The bone is a ledger of daily labour, and the sums don't lie. Cross the channel and run the clock backward to a cold riverine terrace near Heidelberg more than 500,000 years ago, and you meet another narrator, the Mauer Mandible. It is the type specimen of Homo heidelbergensis, and though a jaw is not a yardstick, this jaw reads like a bar of iron. There is no chin, the ramus rises like an anvil plate, and the corpus is deep, thick, and strongly buttressed. Teeth sit in a structure built for repetitive, high-force chewing. The inference is not simply that faces were heavy. It is that the entire craniofacial complex belonged to bodies that spent many hours every day processing tough foods and breathing hard in cold air. The Mauer jaw harmonizes with the Boxgrove tibia. These were people whose average would feel big to many of us today, not because they were fantastically tall, but because they were densely built and thoroughly used. Their size lived in the thickness of bone and the strength of attachments, in the stress traces where muscles anchored and pulled like guy wires against the wind. At roughly the same time period, the lake shores of what is now central Germany preserved something even more intimate than bone, footprints. Trackways at a Paleo Lake margin capture the transience of movement better than any skeleton ever can. They show not just the length of a stride, but the decision in a step, the way the forefoot pushes off, the way soft mud receives a heel and gives way, how a group walks together or strings out with the impatience of youth and the caution of age. The tracks attributed to Homo heidelbergensis are not the prints of colossi. Their dimensions belong to people well within modern human ranges. Yet they fit the robust story told by bones. The strides are long, the impressions deep where bodies loaded the substrate, and when you calibrate foot length to stature, as biomechanics has done again and again, you land on heights consistent with a well-fed, physically demanding life in a cool, temperate Europe. The lake, the wind, the birds, the elephants and deer that shared the shoreline— these are the scales by which those humans measured themselves. They were big in the ways that matter when you stand next to megafauna and need to carry a hindquarter home before other predators arrive. If the Boxgrove tibia and mower jaw sketch the northern body plan, the Broken Hill Man from Zambia offers a southern counterpoint with its own gravitas. 
His brow ridges are architectural, a massive double arc sweeping over the orbits, the frontal bone robust enough to make even Neanderthals nod in approval. The vault holds a brain that sits in the same general bracket as many of ours today, and yet the face still projects. The nasal aperture is broad, the zygomatics are sturdy, and the palate is a platform built for work. This is a skull that rode on a neck and shoulders mounted to a body that earned its meals. The climate at Southern Africa's latitude and epoch oscillated, but it offered enough warmth and productivity to make a large active body a winning bet. When you imagine Broken Hill Man in life, imagine a person who could move long distances, who could sprint if needed, who could wrestle with prey and predators, and who could bear the weight of a heavy day. Size here is function rendered in bone. Slide west to Namibia and step into Berg Aukas, a cave that sealed a different chapter of our story. The femur from Berg Aukas mine, named after a German colonial town in Namibia, often invoked in discussions of seven-foot-tall, powerfully built late Middle Pleistocene and late Pleistocene Africans. This femur has the huge dimensions and well-developed muscle markings of an extremely robust hominin whose quads and hamstrings formed a triad that spent decades launching that body forward. Even without exotic numbers, one understands the point. In populations like the one represented at Berg Aukas, Adults could reach heights that would not surprise in a modern Africa, but, crucially, wore those heights on frames adapted for long-distance walking and sudden, powerful effort. It is a different type of big than the northern Heidelbergensis caste. The message is complementary. Where environment allowed, selection favoured relatively long limbs that shed heat efficiently. And yet the femur's wall thickness, the flare of the condyles, the way the neck sits in the head of the bone— speak of a life that loaded those limbs with the weight of survival. What unites these bones and footprints is not a contest of inches, but the physics of energy and the pragmatics of ecology. In cool Europe, the Heidelbergensis solution ran toward compaction. A large surface area relative to volume bleeds heat, a stockier torso and somewhat shorter limb segments slow that bleed. Muscle mass doubles as a furnace and a motor. In warmer southern Africa, where afternoons could simmer, lengthening the levers of the leg and forearm helps dissipate heat while keeping range and speed high. Both solutions put meat on the table, both keep family safe, both answer the daily demands of their geographies. This is not folklore. The Bergman and Allen rules suggest more robust humans lived during colder climates and imprinted their bones with the signatures of hunting strategies, toolkits, and social dynamics. We can, if we like, do the mathematics. Tibial circumference predicts body mass with error bars. Foot length, scaled to height, tells us where a track maker likely stood if upright in our living room. Femoral head diameter indexes the loads a hip joint carried and suggests how much force those hips routinely transmitted. The Boxgrove tibia takes its place in the high end of modern male ranges for mass. The trackways in Germany yield heights that would blend into a crowd at a football match. The Berg Aukas femur speaks a language of long strides and powerful push-off. The Broken Hill skull insists that big faces and big bodies often travel together, and the Maurer mandible reminds us that chewing, not just chasing, sculpts the skeleton. None of these specimens demand giants. All of them reject delicacy. Crucially, how big is not only about single adults at their prime. The footprints show smaller steps among the larger ones, youngsters who splashed near the shoreline and clung to the shadows of bigger feet. The spectrum of body sizes in a Pleistocene group probably looked much like ours, with adolescents lean and long-limbed as they outgrew their strength for a season, elders carrying the muscle memory of hunts past in somewhat lighter frames, and adults clustering around a robust mean. Sexual dimorphism played its part, but there is little sign that prehistoric human groups were organized around extreme size differences between males and females. Instead, group movement, cooperative foraging, and shared risk made prehistoric bodies stronger and more enduring than we expect, precisely because the daily script demanded endurance more often than it demanded spectacle. When we look beyond bones to what those bodies did, the scale of prehistoric humans becomes more legible. The Boxgrove people killed big game and processed it with flint cleavers and hand axes whose use wear tells of heavy repeated motions. 
The Schoningen Lakeshore hosted hunters whose wooden spears were balanced like javelins, their center of gravity tuned for long, accurate throws, a tradition that presumes shoulders and backs trained by years of practice. The communities represented by the Mauer Jaw and Broken Hill Skull lived through seasonal swings in resource availability and still grew bones that show continuous loading and repair, a testament to diets that could maintain and rebuild tissue even when the cold pressed tight. The Berg Aukus femur stands in for a landscape where distance mattered, where water holes sat like beads on long strings, and where the efficient stride of a tall, strong walker saved lives every dry season. There is a temptation to ask whether our ancestors were bigger than us, as if the archaeological record was a draft board waiting to be updated with each new find. The more honest answer is that prehistoric humans were built to a purpose we rarely need to fulfill now. Many modern people can match the statures suggested by fossil limbs, but far fewer carry that height on bones thickened by a lifetime of manual labor or in muscles tuned to a daily rhythm of gather hall build hunt If we put a box-grove adult in a modern gym and handed them a barbell, they would look like they belonged there. If we dropped a berg orcus adult into a long trail race with heat shimmering off the rocks, they would not be surprised by the work. If Broken Hill Man joined us on a winter hike and the wind cut late in the afternoon, their core would remember what to do without complaint. Their size is not a fantasy of towering stature. It is the quiet, durable kind of size that shows up in bones, not fantasy. And yet there is room in this picture for subtlety. Not every Heidelbergensis limb was heavy as a pillar. Not every African femur reads as a track runner's poem. Not every skull announces power in the same way. Environment mattered, but so did microecology, prey choices, tool traditions, and culture. A group that specialized in ambush and close-range thrusting might build bodies differently than a group that preferred persistence hunting in open country. A lineage that used digging sticks to harvest underground storage organs would mark its humeri differently than a lineage that spent evenings flensing hides and mornings hauling carcasses. In those differences, you see the human story of size as a conversation between genetics and behavior, one that adjustments in childhood nutrition and adolescent activity could nudge this way or that. The footprints in Germany bring us back finally to what big meant on an ordinary day. The track makers were not posing. They were not yet fossils. They were walking, perhaps with a carcass, perhaps scouting, perhaps leading children to a safe margin where they could watch the herds that would feed them in autumn. Their steps press into mud with the persuasion of weight and the calm of belonging. If we walked alongside them, if somehow we could suspend the millennia and match their stride for a few minutes, we would not feel small exactly. We would feel light. We would notice how efficiently they placed their feet, how their arms swung with the easy synchrony of people who carry heavy loads often, how their torsos stayed quiet as their hips and knees did the work we would realize that how big is inseparable from how ready, how practiced, how at home, in a world that gave nothing away for free. So the answer sits there, in the Boxgrove Tibia's confident girth, in the Mauer Jaw's iron bar, in the Broken Hill Skull's heavy arches, in the long purposeful line of a Berg Aukus femur, and in the shallow basins of footprints cupping ancient rain. Prehistoric humans were not giants in the carnival sense. They were big in the engineering sense, big in the way bridges are big, in the way oaks are big, in the way long coastlines are big, through endurance, through strength distributed where it counts, through forms that got the job done again and again for years on end. If we measure size by what a body can do and what it can survive, then the humans who left us these bones and prints were as large as any of us could wish to be. Their stature fits inside our doorways, but their presence in the world, etched into stone and mud, still fills the room. Thank you for watching and commenting.